So to start today, we're going to talk about those bony features. So hopefully you may be familiar with the idea that we have a vertebral column that's helping to support our body and also to enclose our spinal cord. Within the vertebra, we're going to see that there are going to be different divisions of our vertebra. So for example, we have some cervical vertebra, some thoracic, some lumbar, and the sacral vertebra. The first type of vertebra that we see are cervical vertebra. There are seven of these. We then next run into thoracic vertebra, and we're gonna have 12 of these. We'll see that this will be associated with our 12 ribs. We then have five lumbar vertebra. These are in the lower part of our back. And then lastly, we have sacral and coccygeal vertebra. These are fused vertebra, uh, and these are going to be at the very end, the distal end of our vertebral column. So when we think about the vertebra, we want to first start thinking about some of the general features within the vertebra themselves. So here we can see we have two different views of the vertebra. One is going to be a superior view of the vertebra, so we're looking from the top down on the vertebra. And another one is an anterior view, so if we're looking at the front side of the vertebra. So the first thing that we can see is we have a large vertebral body, and this sits very posteriorly and acts as the major structure for the vertebra. We then next find a transverse process, and there would be a transverse process for the right side and for the left side, right? So we can see that we've got a transverse process here, but there's also a transverse process on the left side of this vertebra. We are also going to find that we have a singular spinous process, so it gets its name because it's pointy. When you feel your spine in your back and you feel that through your skin, you can feel those spinous processes. Both these transverse processes and the spinous processes are going to be important attachment sites for muscles, so we'll talk about these again later on today. Now to connect the vertebral body to the transverse process, we have a projection of bone, and we call this projection a pedicle. So that pedicle is going to be connecting between a vertebral body and the transverse process. And again, there would be a pedicle on both sides of the vertebra. So we have a pedicle here, but we also have a pedicle right here. To connect between our transverse process and the spinous process, we also have a junctional area of bone, and we're going to call this the lamina. And we can see this on both our superior view and on this anterior view over here. Again, there's going to be two sets of lamina. So we have a lamina here on the left side of this anterior view. We would also have the lamina right here on the right side of this image. So by joining these processes together, we create an opening within the vertebra, and that's going to be the next thing that we want to identify. And so this opening is going to be called the vertebral foramen, and this vertebral foramen is going to ultimately house the spinal cord itself. Now we're taking a look at a lateral view of the vertebra. We can see a couple of familiar features on this image. So we have the vertebral body here. We've got that large spinous process here. So remember that vertebral body was posterior. That spinous process was more anterior. We want to take a look at a couple of features that we see very well from this lateral view or from the side. So the first feature that we want to see are going to be the superior and inferior articular processes. So obviously we have many vertebra within the vertebral column and they need to articulate or come together with each other. So if we take a look at the image on the right side of the screen, we can see an inferior articular process right here. And then that is meeting up with the superior articular process from the vertebra below it to form this joint, this articulation. This is going to happen throughout all of the vertebra. And when this happens, what we're going to see is that we form this intervertebral foramen. And this will ultimately become very important when we start thinking about how spinal nerves exit our 
vertebral column. When we're thinking about just a singular vertebra, we would just be referring to an intervertebral notch. But typically what you're going to be seeing when you think about the spinal cord and the vertebra, we're going to be thinking primarily about these intervertebral foramen. Lastly, we want to take a look at one feature that is not a bony feature, but is an important part of the vertebral column. This is going to be the intervertebral disc. So in between each of the vertebral bodies, we find an intervertebral disc. This is made up of cartilage, something called fibrocartilage, is very stiff and very supportive and acts kind of like a cushion. However, these intervertebral discs can have some issues as we get older, and that can lead to some important clinical significance. So if we take a look at this image here, this is an MRI image that we're looking at. And what we're able to see in this image, I'll just point a couple of things out for you. We can see here are going to be the vertebral bodies. We can see the spinal cord within that vertebral column. So it would be passing through the vertebral foramen. And what we're seeing is we have a herniation of one of the intervertebral discs. So if we take a look at this disc right here, you can see how that's bulging out from the typical space between the two bodies, and it's impinging on the spinal cord. And this can have important uh, clinical significance because this can cause major, major issues for your patient. This can cause loss of function to muscles. And we'll talk about these things more as we go on throughout the course. But these discs can herniate, uh, and that can cause major issues for individuals and their quality of life. So we've introduced some of the general features of the vertebra, and now we want to start to break down the vertebra into their constituent types of vertebra. So we had cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and we want to look at what distinguishes each of these vertebra from the other types of vertebra. So we're going to start looking at the cervical vertebra, and what we want to see is that there are two specific features that we only see in cervical vertebra. The first is going to be what is referred to as a bifid spinous process. So when we say bifid, you might be thinking bi, two, right? So this V-shape of the process, that's where it gets its name from bifid. It's got this V-shape. It's got two projections. These are only going to be seen in our cervical vertebra. So that's one thing that distinguishes our cervical vertebra from the other vertebra. And then the other important feature is going to be something called the transverse foramen. So there is an opening within the transverse process of the cervical vertebra. And so this opening will ultimately be important for an artery later on in the course. But again, this is something that we would only see in the cervical vertebra. When we think about the thoracic vertebra, we're going to find two specific features only to the thoracic vertebra. And these are going to be features that are associated with our ribs. So if we take a look on our transverse process, which we can see right here, we're going to have a little cup. And we're going to refer to this as a facet. So because this is associated with the ribs, we're going to call it a costal facet. So costal is a word that we use to refer to the ribs. So this structure right here, that's going to be a costal facet. And you'll see this on the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebra. On the vertebral body of our thoracic vertebra, we find these two half cups, one at the superior portion, one at the inferior portion. And because it's half a cup, we call it a demi facet. As I mentioned, these are going to be important structures to think about with the ribs. And so we're going to talk about the ribs right now so we can think about how the ribs articulate with these thoracic vertebra. So in the ribs, we're going to see that we have a couple of specific features. We're going to see that we have a head to our rib. And we also have a bump on the rib, which we're going to call a tubercle. So again, it's a rib structure, so we're going to call it a costal 
tubercle. These two structures are going to be important for that articulation with our thoracic vertebra. So if you take a look at the image on the right hand side of the screen, we're going to be able to see that the head of the rib is going to be articulating with the demi facet of our vertebra. And the costal tubercle, which we can see here, that's going to be articulating with the costal facet on that transverse process. So that's how the ribs are joining up with the thoracic vertebra. And then from there, we're going to see that we have a, something called a costal angle. So this is going to be the angle where the rib is going from posterior to anterior. So right here, we get this turn, this angle within the rib. That would be referred to as the costal angle. And then lastly, within the rib itself, on the inner surface of the rib, we're able to see a groove that we call the costal groove. And this will be a structure that will become important later on in the course uh, when we're thinking about our intercostal muscles and the supply to those muscles. So going back to finish off our vertebral column and the specific features that we see within the vertebral column, when we get down to the lumbar vertebra, what we're going to find is that we've lost a lot of those special specific processes that we saw in the cervical and thoracic vertebra. And instead, what we find is a very large vertebral body. It's going to have the largest vertebral bodies within the vertebral column. And it also has these rounded, more posteriorly facing spinous processes. And then lastly, we want to take a look at our sacrum. And so again, remember the sacrum is formed by five fused vertebrae. And within the sacrum, there are going to be some openings. And so these openings are going to be named for which side of the sacrum that they are on. So we have anterior sacral foramina here on this anterior view. And then we have posterior sacral foramina on the posterior view here. These are going to allow for the passage of nerves out from the sacrum. And then also at the end of the sacrum, there is an opening right here that we can refer to as the sacral hiatus. So it's a space within the sacrum. So to help anchor these bones together within the vertebral column, we have a number of ligaments that we are going to take a look at. There are going to be three that we're going to focus on. The first one that we're going to be able to see, we can see from our lateral view on the right hand side of the screen. This is going to be called an anterior longitudinal ligament. So this is a broad, thick, dense ligament that's going to be extending all the way along the vertebral column. And this is on the anterior side of the column. Similarly, within the vertebral column itself, on the posterior side of the vertebral bodies, we're going to be able to find our next ligament that we need to think about. This is going to be called a posterior longitudinal ligament. So it has a very similar course to the anterior longitudinal ligament, but now we're on the posterior side of the vertebral body, which means we're inside our vertebral column. So we're within that vertebral foramen. And then lastly, if we take a look and we continue to work our way posteriorly towards the spinous processes, we're going to see another ligament that we call ligamentum flavum. And so this ligament is getting its name because of its sort of yellowish appearance that it has. And we can see that right here, right? We've got another ligamentum flavum here, another one here. And again, these are going to be going between the lamina of our individual vertebra. And again, these are all helping to provide structural support to the vertebral column. All right, so here we can take a look at the last bone that we need to see. This is our scapula. And so with the scapula, we are going to see a number of features that we need to identify. These are going to ultimately be very important for attachment sites of muscles. So 
to give you a little context, we've got a posterior view here on the left-hand side of the screen and an anterior view on the right side of the screen. The first feature that we're going to see is going to be a very prominent projection on the posterior side. And this is going to be referred to as the spine of the scapula. And so when you feel on your own back for your scapula or your shoulder blade, this is going to be that big ridge that you feel in your back. Extending superiorly off of the spine of the scapula, we're going to see our next process that's referred to as the acromion process. So acromion, it means a very high point, and so this is the highest point on your scapula. More anteriorly facing is going to be a process called the coracoid process. So we can see that here on the anterior view, and we can also see it here on the posterior view. This coracoid process we'll talk about a number of times. There will be a number of muscles that will attach to this, but this is the most anterior facing of the processes on the scapula. We also want to take a look at some of the positional features of the scapula. So we're going to be able to see that we have a superior angle, the top point on the scapula, and then we have an inferior angle, which is the bottom point on the scapula. There are also two borders. We have a lateral border, more laterally facing, so it faces outward, away from the midline of our body. And we also have a medial border, which faces the medial portion or the midline of our body. And so that medial border would also be right here on our posterior view. There are also going to be a couple of depressions that we need to see within the scapula. And so something to think about when we refer to a depression in anatomy, this is going to refer to as a fossa. And so we can see that there is a fossa above the spine of the scapula. So we will call this the supraspinous fossa. So hopefully that may, name makes some sense. And below the spine, then, we find an infraspinous fossa. So these fossae are going to be very important for some muscle attachments for our next lab. And then there's one more that fossa that we can see on the anterior surface of the scapula. This is called the subscapular fossa. And so if you think about the scapula from a posterior view, this would be the underside. So subscapular fossa should also make some sense. So then to finish off the scapula, we want to take a look at one more feature that we haven't looked at yet. And this is going to be best seen from a lateral view. So to give you some context, we're able to once again find our acromion process and our coracoid process. And in between the two, there's going to be a depression. And so this fossa we're going to refer to as our glenoid fossa. And this will become very important in the next lecture when we start thinking about our humerus and the attachment of our arm to the scapula to form our uh, shoulder joint. But to start today, we're going to think about those bony features uh, for the humerus, sternum, and clavicle. So to start off today, we just want to review quickly this idea of a couple features on the scapula. So if we remember from last time, we saw that we had these two large processes. We had one, the acromion process, and then we had another one, the coracoid process. These two processes are going to be really important when we think about some of the ligaments in our shoulder. We're going to see a lot of ligaments attaching to these two processes. So we're going to need to think about those. We also mentioned with the scapula that there was a structure called the glenoid fossa. And so this glenoid fossa is going to become really important because this is going to be where our humerus is going to ultimately be attaching. So here we can see the humerus. We've got two different views on this. We've got an anterior view and we've got a posterior view because we're going to be able to see different features depending on which view we're looking at. We're going to start off more proximally. If you remember, that means that we are closer to the axial skeletons. So we're closer towards the midline. And so with the humerus and some of those more proximal features, one of the first things that we're going to be able to see is that humeral head. 
We talked about the humeral head articulating with the glenoid fossa. That's forming our shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint. So after we think about the humeral head, we want to start thinking about the idea of bones having a neck. And so similar to you have a head and then a neck just inferior to it, bones are very similar, especially these long bones like the humerus. So we're going to see that there's going to be that humeral head and then just inferior to the humeral head, we're going to get two different types of necks. We're going to see one as an anatomical neck and that's going to be just inferior to the humeral head. And then there's also something called a surgical neck, which we can see over on the anterior view. And so the surgical neck is actually just inferior to these two bumps that we can see. We're going to name these bumps in a minute. But this surgical neck is actually an important clinical site. It can be a place where breaks are very common if the humerus were to fracture. So we mentioned that there are these two bumps that we need to know on the humerus, and these are going to be important attachment sites for some muscles. These two bumps are going to be referred to as tubercles, and they're going to be named based on their relative appearance compared to each other. So the bigger one we're going to call greater, and the smaller one we're going to call lesser. Remember, a tubercle is going to be a bump on a bone is usually a fairly small, condensed type of bump. We'll talk about in a minute the idea of a tuberosity. This is a bigger, broader, typically larger bump on a bone. But for now, we want to think about these two tubercles. So the first tubercle is that greater tubercle. This is going to be more laterally facing. So if we think about this picture here, this would be, that's our lateral side. And so then the more medial of these bumps is going to be our lesser tubercle. That lesser tubercle, we're not going to be able to see from that posterior view. So if we think about this image here, if we look on the posterior view here, right, we can see the greater tubercle, but we can't see that lesser tubercle. That lesser tubercle is only going to be visible from the anterior view. In between the two tubercles, there's going to be a groove where we're going to ultimately find a tendon for a muscle running. But this groove is going to be named because it is between two tubercles. So we can call this the intertubricular groove. We can also refer to it as the bicipital groove. And when we get to talking about the muscles in the arm, we're going to see that there's a tendon running in this groove, as I mentioned going to be for our biceps brachii muscle. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but you can refer to these as either the intertubricular groove or the bicipital groove. Either is fine. So now we're taking a look at another posterior view of the humerus. This time we're articulating with the scapula. And what we can see nicely on this view is two features that we find roughly mid-humerus level. The first one is going to be a fairly large, broad bump on the humerus. And so anytime we see large, broad bumps, we call them tuberosities. This is going to be our deltoid tuberosity. And that deltoid tuberosity is ultimately going to act as an attachment site for our deltoid muscle. We'll talk about that deltoid muscle in more detail later on. But remember this, we're going to be thinking about this later on in our talk today. If we go just slightly posterior to the deltoid tuberosity, we're going to find a little groove. So I'm going just slightly posterior, and this is something you can do in the lab, particularly with the real bone examples of the humerus. You find the deltoid tuberosity along the lateral side of our humerus, and you run your finger just slightly posterior to the deltoid tuberosity, you'll feel a little groove in the bone. This groove is ultimately going to be important for a nerve that we'll talk about when we get to the brachial plexus. But for now, we want to identify this feature, and we're going to be calling this groove the radial groove. So again, to find that radial groove, it's going to be just a little bit posterior to the deltoid tuberosity.
We're now going to start thinking about some of the distal features to so the very end of our humerus. The first things that we want to think about are going to be these structures called epicondyles. And we're going to break the name epicondyle down and so you can understand why we're naming things the way that they are. So if we think about these structures right here, that we can see they're slightly lighter in color. That's because they're covered with this cartilage called hyaline cartilage. These are going to be structures called condyles. We're ultimately going to be naming the condyle and splitting it into two parts. But for now, we just want to think about what is a condyle. A condyle is going to be a smooth articular surface. So anytime that we have these smooth articular surfaces within joints, we typically call them a condyle. So if we have a condyle, and then we have some bone that sits upon the condyle, we'll call that an epicondyle. So we talked last time about the idea of epidermis, layers of cells that sit upon the dermis. Well, now we're thinking about epicondyles, bone that sits upon the condyle. We're going to have two types of epicondyles, and they're named based on where they are on the humerus. So our lateral epicondyle would be out more laterally, and our medial epicondyle then is going to be more medially located, so more towards the midline and more towards the inner portion of our body. Those medial epicondyles are actually very prominent. You can feel them very apparently if you feel your own elbow region. If you feel that medial surface, you're going to feel a big, large bump in your elbow. That's your medial epicondyle. So the next thing that we want to think about is naming that condyle. And so, like I mentioned, this condyle has specific functions. And we're ultimately going to talk about some of the movements that can happen in the elbow in the next lecture. We'll start talking about them this time. We'll finish that up in our next lecture. But because this condyle can do special things, we split the condyle into two parts, and we give those two parts special names. The more lateral portion of our condyle, labeled with a C, we're going to call that the capitulum. So caput, it means head, so this looks like a little head. The more medial part of our condyle, that's labeled with a T, we're going to call that the trochlea. Next time in lecture, we're going to finish up talking about the humerus, and we're going to think a little bit about the elbow joint and how the elbow joint is constructed, the ligaments that hold it in place. But for now, we're going to leave the humerus, and we're going to start thinking about the clavicle and the sternum. So with the clavicle, we can see that it's articulating with both the scapula and with the sternum. So we can see that articulation of the clavicle here with the scapula, and you can see that it's articulating with the acromion process. So we're articulating with the acromion process. And then we're also coming back down here. And the clavicle is going to be articulating with the sternum. So it's acting like a strut between the sternum, which is within the axial skeleton, and our scapula, which is going to be associated with our appendicular skeleton. We next want to think about the sternum and the three parts of the sternum. So the first portion of the sternum is going to be called the manubrium. That's the most superior portion of the sternum, and it's going to mean a handle. So it's going to be this broad, large portion of the sternum. The main segment of the sternum is going to be called the body, and this is going to be where the majority of the ribs that attach to the sternum are going to articulate. And then the distal end of the sternum is going to be called the xiphoid process. One more structure that we want to think about with the sternum is going to be a structure called the sternal angle. You can see that on the screen here. It's between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. So as the manubrium and the body of the sternum come together, they're going to form this slight angle, which we call the sternal angle. This sternal angle is ultimately going to become important as a landmark within the thorax. So remember this sternal angle, we'll talk about this again when we actually get into the thorax and thinking about some of the important structures within the thorax. So that'll be later on 
but something that we'll want to remember for the future. Now that we've covered some of the bony features that we're going to be thinking about in the arm, we want to think about the shoulder joint and those ligaments that are involved in keeping our shoulder joint in place. So if we think about the ligaments in the shoulder joint, they're going to be named very logically. They have long names, but the names make a lot of sense when you break them down. So the first ligament that we're going to look at is going to be called the acromioclavicular joint. So again, long name, but it makes a lot of sense. Right here is the acromion process, and this bone here is going to be the clavicle. So the ligament joining the two makes sense that it's called the acromioclavicular ligament. The next ligament that we're going to find is going to be passing between the coracoid process and the acromion process. So this is called the coracoacromial ligament. Next up, we've got a ligament that's traveling from the humerus over to the coracoid process here. So this is going to be our coracohumeral ligament. So we have a lot of strong ligaments superior at the top of this joint. And there's also a large, broad ligament that's going to be on the anterior side. This is called the glenohumeral ligament. So here we're going from the glenoid fossa to the humerus. And then the last ligament that we want to see is going to be called the transverse humeral ligament. Transverse because it's passing between our two tubercles. So we can see the orientation of the fibers. They're going horizontally. And then it's going to be covering over this tendon here that's within our intertubricular groove or the bicipital groove. This is another view of the ligaments of the shoulder. This time we're in a lateral view. So to give you a little bit of orientation, this side out here is going to be anterior. So this would be the anterior surface. Over here, this is going to be the posterior surface. So we're looking into the glenoid fossa. And we can see a couple of these ligaments again. So we've got things like the coracoacromial ligament that we looked at before. This is a nice view of the coracohumeral ligament. So our humerus would have been sitting within our glenoid fossa. And again, on the anterior side, we find this glenohumeral ligament. One other thing that I want you guys to appreciate from this image is we can see that there's a lot of ligaments on this superior side of the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint. And there's also a lot of musculature on the posterior side. This is where all of our rotator cuff muscles are largely located. We're ultimately going to talk about the rotator cuff muscles in a minute, but most of them are going to be on this posterior side. So we've got a lot of support on the superior portion of our shoulder joint and a lot of support on the posterior side of the shoulder joint but not too much on the anterior side of things. All we've got is essentially that glenohumeral ligament. Because of this, this can have important in clinical implications. So here we can think about shoulder dislocation. So typically with a shoulder dislocation, this is where the head of the humerus is dislocated. It is coming out of the glenohumeral joint. And the most common location for this type of dislocation to occur is going to be on the anterior side. So to start off today, again, we're thinking about the bony features of the ulna and the radius. Before we do that, we're going to review quickly some of those distal features of the humerus, because again, these are gonna be important today. So hopefully you guys remember the idea of our epicondyles just above our condyle, right? Which we can split into two parts, the capitulum, the more lateral segment, and the trochlea, the more medial segment. So there's actually two features that we haven't talked about yet on the humerus. And I waited to talk about these because they are named based on bumps on the ulna. So if we think about these depressions, there are going to be two of them. The first one is on the anterior side of the humerus, and this is going to be called the coronoid fossa. Okay, so again, remember, fossa is a depression, and this is the fossa 
where the coronoid process that we'll see in a minute can sit. On the posterior side then, there's another fossa. This is called the olecranon fossa. And again, this is a depression where a process called the olecranon process can sit. So here's the ulna and the radius. We're gonna look at the ulna first. So the ulna is right here. This is our more medial bone within our forearm. The radius is the more lateral bone in anatomical position. So the first thing that we're going to see associated with our ulna is going to be a notch called the trochlear notch. So if we think back to the humerus that we just saw, we saw that there was a part of the condyle called the trochlea. We can see that on this medial view, right? There's the trochlea associated with our humerus. So then the notch around the trochlea on the ulna makes sense that that's going to be called the trochlear notch. On either side of the trochlear notch are going to be two bumps, two processes. The more anterior bump is going to be called the coronoid process. And when you think about the coronoid process, what I want you to think about is a point, right? So if you take a look at this anterior view, we've got a little point here, or this medial view, right? We've got this pointy projection. The other process on the posterior side of our ulna, this is the olecranon process. And this is what you commonly think of as your elbow. Now we want to think about the proximal end of the radius. And so at the top of the radius, at the proximal end of the radius, there's going to be a radial head. We can see that radial head as well in the medial view. So there's our radial head. And that radial head articulates with the capitulum, right? That little head on the humerus. Just distal to the radial head is going to be another feature that we need to see. This is going to be called the radial tuberosity. So if you remember from last lecture, we talked about biceps brachii. Biceps brachii traveled down within the arm and then ultimately came down and inserted onto that radial tuberosity. So again, tuberosities, they're bigger, broader bumps on a bone. As we work our way distally within the forearm, we're going to be able to see that there's this broad sheet of connective tissue joining these two bones. This is going to be called our interosseous membrane. And this is going to help to anchor the radius to the ulna as it can move within the forearm. And this is also going to act as an important attachment site for many muscles. And then at the very distal end of both the ulna and the radius, there are going to be these pointed projections that are called styloid processes, right? So we have a styloid process of the radius. That would be your more lateral process. And we have a styloid process of the ulna, which would be more medial. And those also are going to be helping to keep the carpal bones in place. So we'll talk about carpal bones in a minute. But first, we want to think about that elbow joint a little bit more. We need to think about some of the ligaments. So here we can see a similar view to what we were just looking at in the previous slide. We've got that medial view here. We've also got a lateral view now on this side. Within the elbow, there are a number of ligaments, and there are three that we need you guys to know for this course. So the first one is going to be a ligament called the annular ligament. And the annular ligament is actually quite interesting. It's going to be wrapping around the head of the radius, right? So we can see the radius is right here. And this ligament is going to wrap around our radial head. And this is going to be important because this is going to allow us to pronate and supinate. So move and rotate the radius around the ulna and keep that radial head up against the capitulum. And this annular ligament is going to be important for that rotational movement, either pronation or supination. There's two other supporting ligaments that help to stabilize this joint. We have one that's on the lateral side and one that's on the medial side. The ligament that's going to be on the lateral side is going to be our radial collateral ligament. So it's a collateral ligament. That means it's supportive. And it's radial, which means it's on the lateral side. The more medial ligament is going to be our ulnar 
collateral ligament. And again, collateral is a supportive ligament on the side of our elbow, and it's going to be going to attach to the ulna, which is here, right? So the more medial of our bones in the forearm. So these two collateral ligaments, they help to stabilize and support this joint. The major movements of pronation and supination are going to be assisted by this annular ligament. So now we want to start thinking about our carpal bones, the bones of our wrist. And then we're also going to continue down and look at the metacarpals and the phalanges, the distal bones in our hands. So first, the carpal bones. There are going to be eight carpal bones. We're going to need to talk about the names of these bones and learn the names of each of these. What we're going to see when we look at this image is we're looking at an anterior or palmar view. So if you're looking at your palmar surface, the palm of your hand, that's the anterior view. So that's what we're seeing here. So again, when you're thinking about this in anatomical position, we can see this is going to be the radius here. Over here is going to be the ulna. So that means that over here, this is lateral, this is medial. We're going to work our way through these carpal bones from lateral to medial, and we're going to have a first row of bones, and then we're going to work our way again from lateral to medial with a second row of bones. So for our first row of bones, as I mentioned, there are four. We're going to be able to see these bones here. So our scaphoid will be the first bone, right? This is an S. This is going to be articulating with the radius here. And I always thought of the scaphoid as the scaffold upon which the radius sits. Medial to the scaphoid would be the lunate. The lunate, when you look at this in lab, you'll be able to see that it kind of has a half moon shape. And that's where it gets its name from. So lunate, like lunar for the moon. Then most medially, there are going to be two bones that are stacked one on top of the other. The first one that we name is the deeper bone. So that's the T, and that's for triquetrum. Then just superficial to triquetrum is this little pisiform bone. So that's going to be our first row of bones. So again, working from lateral to medial, it's scaphoid and lunate triquetrum, and then pisiform. The second row is going to consist of four bones once again. So here, again, those bones are going to be labeled. So TI here, this is going to be for trapezium. When I was learning these bones and thinking about how to identify whether it was trapezium or trapezoid, one thing that I started thinking about was these bones go in alphabetical order here. So trapezium, TI, and then trapezoid, T-O. Next most medial bone to trapezoid is going to be capitate. You can see that here with that C. And then most medially is going to be hamate with an H. And that'll be our most medial bone in this second row. Also associated with hamate, there's going to be this projection that we'll see right here. This is called the hook of the hamate. So the hamate, it kind of looks like a little hammer. And that little hook would be the handle of the hammer. You'll be able to see this in lab, and that can be a good landmark to use when you're trying to orient yourself on which bones you're looking at, which row is where. So those are going to be our carpal bones, the bones in our wrist. Then as we start to work our way distally, we get into the metacarpals and the phalanges. So again, there are those carpals, our most proximal bones in the hand. The next row of bones are going to be our metacarpals, and we're going to name these one through five, starting with the thumb and working all the way over to our fifth digit or the pinky. So we can see that here. So again, they just go one, two, three, four, five. And then the most distal bones are going to be our phalanges. For our thumb, we can see that there's only going to be two phalanges, but for all of our other digits, so two through five, there are going to be three, right? So there's only two here, three there. When we think about how do we name each of these phalanges, the naming is fairly straightforward. The first row of phalanges is going to be our proximal phalanges. So they're labeled with a P here. The next row of phalanges in our digits two through five are going to be called intermediate phalanges. 
Again, because our thumb doesn't have a third phalange, we don't have an intermediate phalange there. And instead, our last row, thumb all the way to fifth digit, are going to be our distal phalanges. So you can see those labels there. So again, we also want to think about the idea that there are joints here that are happening. And these joints will ultimately come up towards the end of this lecture today. So just to sort of bring your attention to these joints, the names are going to be long, but they make a lot of sense. So if we've got a joint between a metacarpal and a phalange, right, right there, we can call this an MP joint or a metacarpophalangeal joint. Long name, but it makes perfect sense, right? It's a joint between the metacarpal and that proximal phalange. The next joint that we would form would be between a proximal phalange and an intermediate phalange. So again, we can look right here and there's a joint there. This is called, you can say a PIP joint or a proximal interphalangeal joint. And then the last joint between the intermediate phalange and our distal phalange, this is going to be called a DIP or a distal interphalangeal joint. So again, I'm not super concerned about you remembering the full specifics of these joints. There's lots of ligaments in here and things like that. But I want you to at least know that these joints exist because when we get to talking about muscles, we are going to reference these joints. But to start, let's look at the contents of the vertebral column. So hopefully you remember from our first lecture some of your features of the vertebra. And these are two that I want to remind you of. We had the vertebral foramen, which was the opening within each vertebra. And then we had the intervertebral foramen, and that was formed by the junction of two vertebra. These two foramina are going to be very important for some of the things that we're going to be looking at today. So if we think about that vertebral column, we have a bunch of these vertebral foramina all in a line. And within there, we're going to be able to find the spinal cord. But surrounding the spinal cord, we need some protection. We don't just want the nerves themselves in contact with our skeletal system in the vertebra. So we have these protective coverings called meninges. And there's going to be three layers to the meninges. So our very first layer is going to be something called the dura mater. This means tough mother. It is an outer, strong, thick coating to our spinal cord and all of our central nervous system. We're going to see these meninges again when we think about the brain later on in this course. So we've got this dura mater, this outer covering. The next layer is going to be called arachnoid mater. And as you can see, if you take a look at this netter image, you can kind of get the idea that it's this webby, thin layer to the meninges. And that webby appearance is where it gets its name from. So arachnoid, think spider webs. And then the last of our meningeal layers is going to be something called pia mater. And the pia mater is going to be directly adherent to neural tissue. So there are only very specific places where we're actually able to see the pia mater. So when we're looking at the spinal cord and we first opened up the meninges, we can see these structures right here that are extending away from the spinal cord itself. These structures are going to be made up of pia mater, but they're very, very thin and very delicate. And so once the spinal cord is opened up, they go away and are lost to the air. So we're not going to really be able to see these extensions very well in lab, but there will be one place that we'll be able to see pia mater, and we'll be talking about that when we get to the end of the spinal cord. And so we can see on this image here, we've got kind of a side by side. We've got an image from Netter on the left, and we have a picture from an atlas uh, by Rowan that's an actual dissection of the spinal cord. But you can see that the spinal cord is going to extend for the entirety of our vertebral column. And we can see that it has a large, broad expanse all the way down to roughly the lumbar region. And then we're going to hit a termination point, and that's where we're going to zoom in uh, and take a look at next.
So when we're thinking about the termination of the spinal cord, this image on the right is a nice example of what we're seeing at the distal end. I don't need you to know all of the specifics of this picture. I'm going to highlight three structures that I want you guys to focus on when you're thinking about the end of the spinal cord. So the first thing that we think about when we're thinking about the end of the spinal cord is something called conus medullaris. And we can see that there it's highlighted with this blue box. This is where the spinal cord actually terminates. It comes down like a little funnel, like a cone, and that's where the spinal cord is going to end. And this is happening roughly around the level of L1, L2. So if we're thinking about the vertebra, it's in the very beginning of our lumbar vertebra. This is going to be important in a minute when we think about a clinical procedure called a lumbar puncture. The next structure that we're going to see is something called the caudae equina. And this is going to be a collection of what are referred to as dorsal and ventral roots. And we're going to see these dorsal and ventral roots when we look at a spinal cord segment. And these are going to contain either motor or sensory fibers, and they're going to be going out to the lower extremity here. So this caudae equina, again, highlighted with this blue box, this looks like a horse's tail. That's what the name means. So it's a collection of all of these roots before they go out to the rest of the body. Separate from the caudae equina, but kind of within the same region, is going to be our last structure, which is called phylum terminale. This phylum terminale is an extension of the pia mater. So that meningeal layer that was adherent to our neural tissue, it extends off of conus medullaris and continues down to the coccyx. And this is going to act as an anchor to help us connect the conus medullaris to the coccyx to stabilize our spinal cord. Because if you think about the spinal cord, it's not just sitting within these meninges by itself. It's also going to be surrounded by this fluid that's called cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. And so it's floating within the vertebral column. And so to give it some support and some substance, we're going to have the spinal terminale helping to anchor the spinal cord in place. That cerebral spinal fluid is actually potentially clinically important, and so we start thinking about something called a lumbar puncture. So on the image over to the right, we can see an example of what you would do for a lumbar puncture. You can see that in a lumbar puncture, we're attempting to perform this procedure a little bit lower, around the levels of L4 or L3. The reason for this, as you now know, is because conus medullaris is ending at roughly L1, L2. So we can insert a needle into what's called the subarachnoid space, so it's below the arachnoid mater, and we can go trying to extract CSF. The bones of the lower extremity. Let's begin with vertebra, thoracic and lumbar vertebra, to sacral vertebra. Sacral vertebra articulate with the os coxae. The os coxae is the pelvic, all, the three pelvic bones. It can also be called the pelvic girdle. Articulating with the pelvic bones is the femur. The femur articulates with the patella, kneecap, and the tibia. The bones of the leg are the tibia and the fibula. More specifically, thoracic vertebra and the lumbar vertebra become five fused sacral vertebra, and here are the coccygeal vertebra. The sacral vertebra or the sacrum articulates with the first of the os coxae, the ilium. Here it is over here, ilium. Here is a bone called the ischium. I prefer to call it ischium. I remember it's got a ch. If we go back to the ilium, we see we have an iliac crest. We have 
iliac crest, then the anterior, the anterior superior, iliac spine, and the anterior inferior. So superior and inferior, iliac spine on the anterior side. Over here, the pubic bone. The pubic bone has two parts, a superior ramus and an inferior ramus. The superior inferior ramus plus the ischium make this large foramen called obturator foramen. Obturator foramen. The pubic bone has a pubic tubercle. This is a tubercle. This will be an attachment for a number of muscles. The two pubic bones have an articulation. This is a fibrocartilage, so the bones don't smash into each other, called the pubic symphysis. All right, all three bones of the os coxae contribute to a cup. The cup is called the acetabulum. It actually means acetic acid cup or vinegar cup. Somebody thought it looked like a vinegar cup. They all contribute to this cup. This is a cup for the head of the femur. And the head of the femur is held in the cup. This is the ligament of the head of the femur. Also right here we see that the obturator foramen is covered with a membrane. And there's a canal inside the membrane. Right, so this is the name. Obturator foramen means it's obscured. In the skeleton, you see it's a foramen. In the living specimen, it's covered. The foramen is obscured. It's covered with a membrane, the obturator membrane. Okay, moving to the thigh and the femur. The head of the femur becomes the neck of the femur. And at this location are two attachment sites for muscles. The greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter. Here's the lesser trochanter from the posterior view. Continue down the femur. And the two articular sites. A condyle is an articular site. Medial condyle, lateral condyle. Epicondyle simply means it's just above the condyle. The medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle. Also importantly, superior to the medial epicondyle is this large bump adductor tubercle. The adductor muscles will have attachment here, attachment here, right? If these move together, the thigh moves towards the midline adduction. Let's look at the posterior view. <clears throat> a very large rough line called linea spera, the rough line, and close to it, the pectineal line. I cover the pectineal line, a muscle called pectineus. This is the attachment of pectineus. All right, let's go to the hip. The hip has three ligaments, very strong ligaments, to stabilize the hip joint. Um, they all tell you where they're going. All right, we'll start with, this one has two parts, so it's said to be Y-shaped. And from the ilium to the femur, we have ilium to the femur. We have iliofemoral. From the pubic bone to the femur, pubofemoral. And from a posterior view, from the ischium to the femur, ischiofemoral. All right, so from a posterior view, from the ilium to the femur, from the pubic to the femur, from the ischium to the femur. So the ligaments surround 
the head of the femur, that's why we can't see it, and work together to form a very stable joint. We do gain stability, but from moving your own thigh at the hip, you probably know the stability is at the expense of mobility. If we look inside the ligaments, we see the head of the femur and the ligament of the head of the femur attached to the acetabulum. Let's start with the vertebra. We know we have seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral. The sacral are fused. Here they are, the sacral, the fused sacral vertebra articulate with the ilium. We have ilium. Here we have sacrum, and here we have the pubis, or the pubic bone. This is the view from the posterior. Um, also from the posterior view, we can see the iliac arch, um, the sacral foramina. Think of these as the intervertebral foramen. This is how the spinal nerves will exit from sacral spinal cord segments. All right, we have two notches, greater sciatic, lesser sciatic notch. They are separated from each other by the spine of the ischium, the ischial spine. So greater sciatic notch, ischial spine, lesser sciatic notch. Ischial tuberosity. This is a very strong attachment point for the hamstring muscles of the posterior thigh. So at this point, just scooch over Reflect your gluteus maximus out of the way and feel that big bump. This is the bump that you would, that touches your bicycle seat when you ride the 10 speed bicycle. It's very large, it's a very large attachment site. All right, so here we are again iliac crest, posterior ilium, couple of fossa, greater sciatic notch, ischial spine, lesser sciatic notch ischial tuberosity and we know in the posterior thigh here's linea aspera the big long rough line which is an, another large attachment site for quite a number of muscles all right if we add some ligaments all right from the sacrum we have the sacroiliac ligaments right these have to be very strong they hold the sacroiliac joint then from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity sacro tuberous ligament right from the sacrum ischial tuberosity sacro tuberous ligament all right from the sacrum to the ischial spine sacro spinous ligament from the sacrum to the ischial spine, sacrospinous. All right, so now we see we have the greater sciatic notch, sacrospinous ligament. Now we have the greater sciatic foramen. Um, we have the lesser sciatic notch plus the sacrotuberous ligament, and we have the lesser sciatic foramen. All right, from an anterior view, greater sciatic notch plus the sacrospinous ligament, we have greater sciatic foramen. Lesser sciatic notch, sacrotuberous ligament, right? We have the lesser sciatic foramen. The bones of the leg are the tibia and the fibula. All right, so we see how the tibia articulates with the femur and articulates at the ankle. 
Um, so we now have medial and lateral tibial condyles, articulation sites. Right across the way, we have medial and lateral femoral condyles, the articulation sites of the femur. The tibial tuberosity, we remember that as the quadriceps and set the quadricep tendon inserts into the patella and the patellar ligament inserts into the tibial tuberosity. All right. Um, above the ankle, the process here is called the medial malleolus. The lateral bone is the fibula. We have the head of the fibula and the lateral malleolus. The lateral medial malleolus make an articulation site with the bones of the ankle, the tarsals. The fibula, the lateral malleolus. Um, the tibia articulates directly with this bone of the foot, the talus. The tibia articulates with the talus. The lateral malleolus articulates with the talus, but is not weight-bearing. So the talus is here, articulates with the tibia. The heel bone is the calcaneus. All right, from the medial side, the talus. And this is the calcaneus. Um, one feature of the calcaneus is right here. It's called sustentaculum talli. It sustains the talus. It means it holds up or articulates with the talus. It's part of the calcaneus. Here is the sustentaculum talli in this view as well. All right, let's look at the knee. All right, we can see as the knee flexes, we see the we see the tibia articulate with the femur. And importantly, we see the patella. Notice in that the patella articulates with the femur. The patella does not articulate with the tibia. And again, the quadriceps tendons. Quadriceps tendon from all the quadriceps femoris attach on the patella. From the patella to the tibial tuberosity, we have the patellar ligament. Um, again, let's remember um, muscle attaches to a bone by a tendon and a bone attaches to a bone by a, a ligament. All right, so here is a femur. This is the medial condyle of the femur. The lateral condyle of the femur articulates with the medial and lateral condyle of the tibia. All right, there are ligaments to hold the femur in place to the tibia from the medial epicondyle to the medial condyle of the tibia on the medial side this is the medial collateral ligament since it inserts in the tibia it can also be called the tibial collateral ligament over here lateral condyle of the femur to the head of the fibula it is on the lateral side so it is the lateral collateral ligament. Since it attaches to the fibula, it's the fibular collateral ligament. All right, two more ligaments from femur to tibia, from posterior femur to anterior tibia. It's the anterior cruciate. Cruciate lets you know there are two and they cross from the anterior femur back here to the posterior tibia. It's the posterior cruciate ligament. Note that their no name, the cruciate ligaments, are named for their insertion into the tibia. Anterior cruciate ligament to the anterior tibia, posterior cruciate back here to the posterior tibia. All right, so we can see the articulation. All right, if we watch the ligaments, we will notice the anterior cruciate ligament tightens when the leg is extended. The posterior cruciate tightens as the leg is flexed. So as the leg 
flexes, it tightens the posterior cruciate. As the leg is extended now, the anterior cruciate is tightened. So when standing and fully extended, the anterior cruciate is taut. All right, to examine the cruciate ligaments, right, the knee is flexed, and to examine the anterior cruciate, here's the anterior part of the tibia, anterior cruciate. So the tibia is grasped firmly and pulled anteriorly. If the anterior cruciate is intact, the tibia will not move. If the tibia displaces anteriorly, it's positive for a tear. It's a positive anterior drawer or Lachman's test. Likewise, here is the posterior cruciate ligament inserted in the posterior tibia. And again, the tibia is graspably firmed and pushed posteriorly. If the posterior cruciate is intact, the tibia will not displace posteriorly. If it is severed, the posterior will move the tibia will move, will be displaced posteriorly. It's a positive posterior cruciate tear. In this figure, the knee capsule is open, and we see the condyle of the femur, and down here is the condyle of the tibia. Notice that they are not actually in contact. There is a fibro cartilage pad separating the two. These fibro cartilage pads, um, they protect and also form a nice articular disc for the femur. On the medial side, it's called the medial meniscus. On the lateral side, it's called the lateral meniscus. And these are somewhat different. On the medial side, notice that the medial meniscus has a strong attachment to the medial collateral ligament. There is no attachment. On the lateral side, there is an opening on the lateral side. From above, we see here's the medial meniscus and its attachment to the medial collateral ligament. On the lateral side, quite differently, the lateral meniscus is not attached to the lateral collateral ligament. In fact, there is a tendon in that space between the medial meniscus attached to the medial collateral the lateral meniscus separated from the lateral collateral by a ligament. Right. If this is medial, medial side, lateral side, this is ventral, so we know this is the anterior cruciate because it's inserting into the anterior part of the tibia. A quick clinical case <clears throat> called the unhappy triad. Right. This is right femur, right tibia. This is the lateral side. The lateral collateral will be here. The medial collateral here in the medial meniscus. All right, so notice that the trauma is on the lateral side, right? So the, the lateral side um, just articulates, but on the medial side, the distance between the bones opens. Right? That means the lateral collateral is being stretched and it stretches beyond its ability and it snaps. Right? So it snaps. As it's stretching, it's also pulling the medial meniscus. The medial meniscus gets stretched beyond its means and it snaps. All right. Also notice, do we remember the anterior cruciate? is taut when the leg is extended and here it is being stretched as this space here is expanding the anterior cruciate gets stretched beyond its means and it snaps so the terrible triad medial cru medial collateral medial meniscus anterior cruciate the lateral collateral will not be damaged because it is actually getting shorter or more likely not affected at all. Some bones. All right, we can notice right away 
the tibia articulates with a, the first tarsal called the talus. The fibula does articulate with the talus, but it is not weight-bearing. All right, so the tibia would articulate with the talus. Here's the talus. It articulates with the heel bone, the calcaneus. It articulates with navicular navicular I think it's supposed to be shaped like a bone think navy the navicular <laughs> articulates with three bones they are wedge shaped the word cuneiform means wedge shape we have a medial an intermediate on the other side we'll see lateral cuneiform we then have the metatarsals one through five right if these are tarsals these are metatarsals and of course the phalanges um, we might note that um, phalanges of the big toe there are only two whereas all the other digits have three phalanges all right the tarsals from the lateral side um, again, the talus articulates with calcaneus and navicular. We can't see the medial cuneiform, but we see the intermediate and the lateral. And then the last tarsal is the cuboid. Notice how the cuboid is in a position between calcaneus and the fifth metatarsal and articulates laterally with navicular and the lateral cuneiform. All right, let's talk about the joints of the ankle. They're very strong and very important. This is a weight-bearing joint with strong ligaments. First ligament, what would you call ligament between bones? How about interosseous ligament? Interosseous between bones. So this is the interosseous ligament between the tibia and the fibula. Yeah, so we also have um, some ligaments in the ankle that take their name because they go from tibio, tibia to fibular. So we have the anterior tibiofibular from the tibia to the fibular. Over here, the posterior from the tibia to the fibula. Now we're going to talk about ligaments between either the tibia to a tarsal or from a tarsal to a fibula. And as we name these, the direction of the names will go from medial to lateral. So on the medial side, they'll go from tibia to the name of the tarsal. On the lateral side, they'll go, first we'll say the name of the tarsal, and then to the fibula. All right, so tibio to tarsal on the medial side. All the, all the ligaments will start with tibia and then simply state the name of the tarsal that they attach. Then as we go more lateral, we're going to start with the name of the tarsal, and the name will end because they're inserting into the fibula. All right, medial side. There are four of them. They kind of make a triangle, so they are referred to as the deltoid ligaments. They'll all start with the word tibia. The first one starts at the tibia and goes to the talus just below and the posterior here's the posterior tibio talar anterior and posterior tibio talar if we go straight tibio calcaneal but note that it's actually attaching to the sustentaculum talli and then finally from the tibia to the navicular tibio navicular all right so here's the talus two to the talus one to the calcaneus actually sustentaculum talli and one from the tibia to the navicular all right on the lateral side there are three they're called collateral they are going to start with the name of the tarsal and end with the word 
fibula because that's their insertion. All right, so again, here is the big talus to, to the fibula. So anterior tallow, fibular, and posterior tallow, fibular. And then again, calcaneal, fibular, just like on the medial side, calcaneal, fibular, ligament. From the medial to the lateral, we start with the word tibia and then the name of the tarsal. So tibia tallow, this is the posterior tibia tallow, and then tallow fibular, posterior tallow fibular. From the tibia to the calcaneus, tibial calcaneo. But over here, it goes calcaneal fibular. The thoracic wall. <clears throat> All right, so this is often called the thoracic cage. It's for both protection and respiration, protection from the bony components, respiration because the lungs are actually attached to the thoracic wall, the way to make the, wall. the lungs fill with air is to expand the volume of the thoracic wall, creating a, a vacuum inside the lungs and air to flow inside. All right, if we look at the bony features, we have the manubrium, the sternum or the body of the sternum, and the xiphoid process. So <clears throat> um, these are named as if a manubrium means handle. So this is named as if primitive man used this as a weapon. Um, 12 ribs, one through 14. Notice the true ribs have their own costal cartilage. The costal cartilage is a cartilage that attaches the rib to the sternum. Seven have these. Um, eight, nine, and ten join the seventh, and then eleven and twelve are free floating. Posteriorly, we have the twelve thoracic vertebras, T1 to T12. Um, the opening at the top is called the superior thoracic aperture, and at the bottom, which is covered by the respiratory diaphragm, is the inferior thoracic aperture. All right, before we leave, a couple important things. The superior board of the manubrium is the sternal notch. The manubrial sternal junction is called the sternal angle. And the sternum and the xiphoid, the xiphosternal joint. All right, at this point, notice the sternal angle is a nice landmark for the second rib. If you if you palpate your sternal angle, you can feel your second rib. All right, so the ribs basically have a couple features. So the head is going to articulate with thoracic vertebra. The tubercle will articulate with the transverse process of thoracic vertebra. And this is the end that articulates with the costal cartilage. Importantly, the lateral one-third is called the costal angle. The inferior surface, only in the costal angle, there's a groove. The costal groove, and we'll see shortly, this is for a, a vein, artery, and nerve. A vein, artery, and nerve. So keep in mind, van. Now, what we, when we talk about the gastrointestinal tract, uh, developmentally, there are three vessels supplying different parts of the GI tract. And based on that blood supply, we divide the GI tract into foregut, medgut, and hindgut. And you can see those divisions happening there and here. So the foregut it's composed by the abdominal esophagus, the stomach, the first half of the duodenum, and the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen, 
in the pancreas. When we talk about midgut, we take um, off where we stop on the foregut, and that would be the distal duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, the ascending colon, and most of the transverse colon. It's just the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. And finally, for the hindgut, it's the distal one-third of the transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and rectum. So today we are just going to talk about the foregut and we'll leave midgut and hindgut for the next lecture. Now this picture here is showing you the difference between organs that are intraperitoneal um, in yellow and retroperitoneal in pink and orange. It's basically a cheat sheet for remembering what's intraperitoneal versus retroperitoneal. And you will encounter this picture also in the embryology lecture. Now moving on to the actual organs. Um, you saw the esophagus when you talked about the mediastinum. It's just a muscular tube that moves food from the oral cavity to the stomach. And it does enter the abdominal cavity through the esophageal hiatus. There is a muscular structure uh, around the esophageal hiatus called the cruise of the diaphragm. And we will be seeing that in the next part of the lecture. So when we talk about the stomach, uh, we can divide the stomach into several parts. I have highlighted the ones that we often mention, the fundus being the top of it right here, the cardia as this region, the beginning of the stomach, and then the body is the largest area, and then finally the pyloric canal. Now other features that you will see are the curvatures of the stomach, the greater curvature on the left side of the body and the lesser curvature on the right side of the body. The stomach itself is a temporary storage of, of food and a place for mixing of food and it starts the food breakdown both chemically and mechanically. And when we take a look at the inside of the stomach you will see this characteristic wrinkles inside um, the stomach, the mucosa of the stomach and these are called rogae, and what they do is they allow the stomach to expand when food comes in. But you also will see two regions where there are sphincters, the lower esophageal sphincter at the entrance of the stomach and the pyloric sphincter at the exit of the stomach. If we move, um, down, um, before we talk about the duodenum, let's talk about the liver. So the liver can be divided into lobes, either anatomically or functionally. So when we talk about um, the liver here in gross anatomy, we will just refer to the four anatomical lobes. And those will be the right lobe and the left lobe. But then if we lift the liver um, or we move it as if it were a page, um, then we will see that on the posterior aspect of the liver, we will see a caudate lobe and a quadrate lobe. Those don't necessarily exactly match up uh, with a, basically a left and right side but um, you can see functionally in physiology how um, the lobes can be subdivided into even more parts. Now with the liver we also talk about the gallbladder. So just a reminder the liver filters the blood returning from the GI tract. It also stores glycogen and it also secretes bile constantly. And this bile will be stored in the gallbladder, just ready to be dispensed when needed. Now, when um, this happens, when the food arrives, 
and the, the bile is released um, through the biliary ducts. So you can see here the cystic duct as part of the gallbladder and then the bile duct um, going into the duodenum. The right and left hepatic ducts are the ones that bring the bile from the liver down either into the bile duct per se or down into the cystic duct for, for storage into the gallbladder. Now, when we talk about connections between the liver and the stomach, we see that there, and you will observe this clearly in the lab, there is a film, um, sort of like a layer of thin fascial tissue between the liver and the stomach and between the liver and the first part of the duodenum. Now these, these connections are a remnant of what we mentioned earlier, the ventral mesentery. And you will understand how this ends up being this way when, we, when you look at the embryology lecture. But for now, what you need to know is that the liver and the stomach are connected by what we call the hepatogastric ligament. Hepato from liver, gastric from stomach. So this is the hepatogastric ligament. And then the liver and the duodenum are connected by what we call the hepatoduodenal ligament. These two ligaments together, the hepatoduodenal and the hepatogastric, together they form what we call also the lesser omentum. Remember we talked about the greater omentum here? This is called the lesser omentum. Now, an important structure is located in um, the hepatoduodenal ligament, and you can see it here. It is what we call the portal triad. The portal triad consists of the hepatic portal vein, which is what brings all the GI tract blood up to the liver for filtering. And then you have the hepatic artery proper and the bile duct. Now we can move on to look at the duodenum. And the duodenum has four parts, a superior descending, inferior, and ascending part. You can see how most of it is attached to the posterior abdominal wall, and it forms kind of a C shape around the head of the pancreas. This is the pancreas here. Now the duodenum is, um, uh, the next step for or the next place for the food to go to it receives the chyme um, from the stomach and when the chyme enters the duodenum it triggers the secretions of bile from the liver and the gallbladder but it also triggers the secretion of enzymes from the pancreas now these things will enter the duodenum through um, both the main pancreatic duct and um, the bile duct that you could kind of see over here. So those two will open into what we call the major duodenal papilla. Now when we take a look at the pancreas itself, we see that it also has four parts, the head, the neck, the body, and the tail, and it's nested here on that C-shaped duodenum, and it goes all the way out to touch almost the spleen. Now the pancreas is an accessory digestive gland. It has both endocrine and exocrine um, functions. So the exocrine secretion is uh, pancreatic juice into the duodenum, but it also has an endocrine secretion of glucagon and insulin into the bloodstream. When we take again a look at the inside of the pancreas, you can see the main pancreatic duct going down here and then joining the bile duct, duct into the major duodenal papilla um, into the duodenum. Now, we should briefly talk about the spleen. So as you can tell, the spleen is not really technically connected to the digestive tract. 
It is, in fact, a lymphatic organ, not a digestive organ. But it is there in the abdominal cavity, so we have to acknowledge it. It is located on the left side of the body. And uh, it's a site of lymphocyte proliferation and immune surveillance. Um, it will identify and remove expanded red blood cells or broken down platelets and will also recycle iron and globin. So let's start by going back to this slide where uh, you, should familiar, you should be familiar with. Remember, we defined the foregut already, and uh, let's review what belongs to midgut and hindgut. So for the midgut, uh, we start with the distal part of the duodenum. We include the small intestines, the jejunum and ileum, and then we move on to ascending colon and the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. The hindgut is the distal one-third of the transverse colon, the descending and the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. So the GI tract can be divided into so many different ways. Um, we can divide it embryologically, like we have been doing, into foregut, midgut, and hindgut. And it could be also divided into upper GI and lower GI, or it could be divided into the foregut parts and then the small intestines versus large intestines, for example. So for midgut and hindgut, it may be easier to divide it into small versus large intestines, just keeping in mind where the transition from midgut to hindgut is. So small intestines will be composed by basically the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Just remember that the duodenum is part foregut, part midgut. But there is one structure here that will help us anatomically to differentiate um, the transition between the duodenum and um, the jejunum. So recall that when we talked about the esophagus entering the abdominal cavity, we said that it enters through the esophageal hiatus and that there was this muscular loop of tissue going around it. Um, this is called the cruise of the diaphragm. So there's this extension of the cruise of the diaphragm uh, called the ligament of trites. And this ligament of trites comes down all the way to anchor basically uh, the last part of the duodenum. So that ligament of trites is used to demarcate in the transition from duodenum, which was coming all the way here, into jejunum. It also can be used clinically to mark the boundaries between the upper GI and the lower GI. So anything that was before the ligament of trites is upper GI, and everything after that is lower GI. And it's also the point where the GI tract resumes an intraperitoneal course. Remember that the duodenum and the pancreas were retroperitoneal, and just like the very last part of the duodenum becomes intraperitoneal again. When we look at the jejunum and ileum, um, we can tell that collectively they are six to seven meters long. Their main function is to absorb nutrients and minerals. And we can't really tell grossly what uh, is jejunum and what's ileum in this uh, position where we open the abdomen, but in average, the jejunum is located mostly on the upper left quadrant of the body, just in that blue shaded area that you see there. We take a closer look at the small intestines, then we can see the differences. For example, for the jejunum, we will see that in the mesentery holding the jejunum, you can see the vessels having long vasorecta or straight arteries and a few arcades or a few um, sort of loops of, of arteries there. It has greater vascularity um, than the ileum, which you can see here, 
that its characteristics are to have very short vasa recta, but then many short arcades. You see them there. It has less vascularity too. So the large intestines are um, basically the colon, and they will be framing small intestines when you take a look at the in situ organs. Uh, part of it belongs to midgut and part belongs to the hindgut. Remember, here's where that um, demarcation happens. That line is there to remind you that is the transition between midgut and hindgut. And it is the place where water is absorbed from indigestible residues of chyme and converted into stool. When we take a look at uh, the entire length of the large intestines, we will start at the transition between the small intestines and large intestines is this region on the lower right quadrant where uh, we have the cecum. This is the very beginning of the large intestines. Right down here is the vermiform appendix, which is not completely uh, drawn in this picture. And then we have the different parts. We have the ascending colon right here, and then the transverse colon, and the descending, and then stigmoid, forming an S, and the rectum and the anal canal. You can appreciate also that at each of the corners, uh, you will see the right colic flexure or also called hepatic flexure because it's by the liver. And then the left colic flexure or also called splenic flexure because it's by the spleen. So other features of the large intestines will be that it has omental appendices. Uh, they're kind of like small, fatty, omentum-like projections. You see those, they're those yellow things that you see hanging there. It also has what's called the tinea coli. They are longitudinal bands of smooth muscle that go along the entire length of the colon. And this uh, tinea coli sort of um, contracts the center of the large intestines, contributing to the bulging of the sides of the large intestines. And those bulgings are called hostra. And they are called hostra saculations. Um, they are just between the tinea. Obviously, the greater the large intestines have greater caliber than the small intestines as well. So let's take a look at the different parts. So here we have the ileocecal junction. That is the very beginning of the large intestines. You can see it from the outside on this picture and with the wall of the colon removed on this picture. See how there is an ileocecal bulb there where um, is the connection between the ileum and the cecum. You can also see the vermiform appendix coming down at the end of the cecum. So the cecum is just a blind pouch. Um, the vermiform appendix is also a blind um, diverticulum. It could be between 6 and 10 centimeters long, and it has lymphoid tissue in it. Sometimes, especially when you're looking for it in the lab, it could acquire a position where it's sitting behind the cecum, so make sure that you look everywhere for the appendix before assuming that it's not there. Now, the colon itself, remember, it's composed by ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. Um, the different parts have overall different functions. The cecum is the collection of the chyme. The ascending, transverse, and descending is where that there's absorption of water and electrolytes, and the sigmoid colon is basically the last step where uh, it is a storage of waste. 
Now, finally, we have the rectum and the anal canal. This uh, rectum and anal canal are not really straight, as the name suggests, but mostly follows the curvature of the sacrum and coccyx. And it ends um, anterior inferiorly to the tip of the coccyx abdominal wall. So the urinary system has a few features, uh, functions. It stores urine, it will excrete urine, it also regulates blood volume, and most importantly, it regulates ion balance and acid-base balance. So here is a very schematic drawing of the components of the urinary system. Uh, we have the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra, which is not um, pictured here. But generally, um, if we take a look from the posterior abdominal wall, you can see that um, the left kidney is generally located a little higher up than the right kidney. That's because of the presence of the liver on this side, pushing it down a little. It is really at the level of the 12th rib and mostly protected by musculature. And if we take a look from inside the abdominal cavity, uh, we will have to remove the peritoneum to be able to access them. If you recall from the previous lecture, we talked about the urinary system being retroperitoneal. In this picture, you can also see how the peritoneum is covering the duodenum and the pancreas as well. So let's remove that peritoneum and the pancreas and the duodenum, and you will see the kidneys um, inside. Notice how there are um, structures up here. We'll talk about those, of the, the suprarenal glands. And um, they are just kind of brownish organs um, that are about, I mean, average 12 centimeters long, but uh, that size can vary greatly. Also notice how they are surrounded by fat, and we will be talking about that fat and the arrangement of fat around the kidneys. So the kidneys have a concave medial border. Uh, it's called the hilum or entrance, and um, that's where the vessels and the nerves and the ureter um, ex enter and exit the uh, kidney. If we take a look at the inside of the kidney, we will see that the hilum is continuous with the inside of the kidney into a space called the renal sinus. This renal sinus area houses the renal arteries, the renal veins, the lymphatic drainage, but also nerves and the renal pelvis, which is the beginning of the ureter, um, as well as the calluses in the adipose tissue. Now, the kidneys are um, relatively delicate organs and they need some protection. Um, they are, remember, just located on the posterior abdominal wall. So there's a few structures that surround the kidney that give the kidneys the protection they need. So if we start from innermost to outermost, the first thing we will see is the layer of fibrous capsule or renal capsule. It's just irregular connective tissue and it gives the kidney its shape. It protects it from trauma and helps prevent infections from entering it. Now after that capsule, like more externally to the capsule, we will see what we call perinephric fat or perirenal fat. You will see that nephric and renal are interchangeable. It's just adipose tissue and completely surrounds the kidney and offers cushioning and insulation. I, it's really hard to find pictures that depict it, but I left the same picture because if you look at just the area below the suprarenals, you can see a little bit of fat there that fat will extend around the kidney. If we take a look at this drawing from Netters, it's a sagittal view. You can see 
the kidney here with its um, fibrous capsule, and then on the outside, a layer of fat surrounding the kidney. So that is the perinephric fat. Peri means around. Now, after that, we will encounter another fascia called the renal fascia. And that is, again, um, dense irregular connective tissue, and it anchors the kidney to the posterior abdominal wall and the peritoneum. And there is one more layer of fat surrounding the renal fascia, and that is the paranephric fat. Now, para means alongside or near. And so remember the perinephric fat is just immediately surrounding the kidney. The paranephric fat is in the vicinity. So it's the outermost layer of fat that protects the kidney. Here is another view. Um, just uh, when you take a look at this, um, make sure that you notice that this picture is does not follow the convention of looking at the patient from as if you are looking at the patient from their feet. Uh, notice that this is a view from above the abdomen. Um, so um, the spleen is here on the left side, and this is liver. But it shows you the point here is just to show you the kidneys and the different layers of fascia and fat. So if we take a closer look at the structure of the kidney inside, you'll see that the kidney is composed by a cortex and a medulla. And so the cortex goes, extends in between the medulla and it creates this sort of columns of cortex. Those are called cortical columns. And the shape that the medulla takes is the shape of an inverted pyramid. Um, it's called the renal pyramid or papilla. And so when we see the tip of the pyramid right here, each of them, we will see that that pyramid, the tip of the pyramid, connects to an opening called the minor calyx. There are several minor calyxes, one for each pyramid. Now, a few of those minor calyxes will converge into what we call a major calyx. And then the major calyxes will form the renal pelvis, which is that area over there. The renal pelvis is basically the entrance into the ureter. Now, you will remember that I mentioned the presence of the adrenal glands or suprarenal glands on top of the kidneys. These um, glands have two parts. There is a suprarenal cortex, which secretes corticosteroids and androgens, and then there's a medulla, which is a mass of nervous tissue which is derived from neural crest cells and is associated with the sympathetic nervous system. They um, will play a role into the regulation of the uh, reabsorption of certain products and especially on the balance of blood volume but they are not really parts of the urinary system or the gastrointestinal system. They are its own thing. They are very unique glands. And we mention them because they are associated with the kidneys, but you will talk about them more when you do um, the nervous system. What is particularly unique about these glands is that they receive blood supply, arterial supply, from three sources. You can see in this picture right here, the superior, um, the middle, and the inferior suprarenal arteries, but their blood um, return or venous return is only through one uh, vein, 
It, they will be hard to find in the lab. Um, they look just like fat, but sometimes you can locate them if you attempt to find the vessels supplying them, specifically um, finding the inferior phrenic arteries um, up here and all the little branches coming off of that or even finding the renal arteries and then finding a branch going up to what looks like a piece of fat but would be the suprarenal glands. The urinary tract is if composed of everything else other than the kidneys that belongs to the um, urinary system. The beginning is the ureters, which are long fibromuscular tubes that are located retroperitoneal. And they conduct urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is here for storage of urine, and those ureters enter the bladder um, from um, the posterior lateral wall. So it this is a view from above the bladder, and you can see the ureters coming there, posterior laterally, um, going into the urinary bladder. We'll begin with this anterior view of the pelvis and the lower part of the vertebral column. The pelvis performs a variety of functions. It receives the weight of the body from the vertebral column through the sacroiliac joints. The pelvis articulates with femurs at the hip joints. And the left and right side of the pelvis are somewhat mobile due to an articulation uh, in the midline of the anterior pelvis called the pubic symphysis between the pubic bones. So with the two sacroiliac joints and the pubic symphysis, the left and right sides of the pelvis can move um, somewhat independent of one another, especially seen with walking and running. This is a lateral view of the right side of the pelvis. Each side of the pelvis is formed by the fusion of three bones during development. Ilium, toward the top. The ischium, toward the lower posterior aspect. And the pubis, toward the anterior aspect. The superior edge of the ilium is called the iliac crest. If we look at the posterior aspect of the ilium, we see this notch of bone here called the greater sciatic notch. The ischial tuberosities are fairly robust regions of the ischium. They help to support the weight of the body in sitting, and they're also used for muscle attachment. The spine of the ischium is this projection here. And just below that, or inferior to the spine, is another notch of bone called the lesser sciatic notch. So the spine of the ischium is located between the greater and lesser sciatic notches. The pubic tubercle is a prominence on the anterior aspect of the pubic bone. The term ramus means uh, slender projection of bone. So with the pubic bone, its ramus is this part right here, and the ischium also has a ramus that travels up to meet it. So when these bones fuse, the two rami combine to form the ischio-pubic ramus. The acetabulum is a large cup-like depression on the lateral pelvis. It's going to articulate with the head of the femur, forming a ball and socket joint, the hip joint. Just below the acetabulum is a large opening called the obturator foramen. Um, this opening, however, is mostly filled in in the intact pelvis with uh, muscle and connective tissue, leaving just a narrow canal called the obturator canal. We're looking down into the pelvis to distinguish between the false pelvis and true pelvis. On the left, uh, the highlighted area represents the uh, upper part, which is the false pelvis. Uh, 
Uh, it's called the false pelvis because it functions as part of the abdominal cavity holding the lower digestive organs. On the right we see the shaded area indicating the true pelvis, that part which uh, contains the pelvic organs. Next we'll look at the ligaments of the pelvis. This picture shows a posterior view of the pelvis, mainly highlighting the right side. There are strong ligaments on the anterior and posterior uh, pelvis called sacroiliac ligaments. They're found on the posterior and anterior aspects of the sacroiliac joint. Uh, they will strongly bind the sacrum to the pelvis. The sacrotuberous ligament, indicated here, uh, runs from the inferior lateral border of the sacrum down to the ischial tuberosity here, sacrotuberous. The sacrospinous ligament is going to be deep to it, um, and it also originates from the inferior lateral border of the sacrum and inserts here onto the spine of the ischium. Again, this notch of bone here is the greater sciatic notch. This notch of bone here is the lesser sciatic notch, with the spine of the ischium separating them. With these ligaments in place, those notches are converted into foramina. Here, the greater sciatic notch is converted into the greater sciatic foramen. The lesser sciatic notch is converted into the lesser sciatic foramen. This is a medial view of the right side of the pelvis. Uh, again, we are able to see from now an internal view the sacrospinous ligament coming from the uh, lateral sacrum and inserting here into the spine of the ischium, and then the sacrotuberous ligament also originating from the sacrum, inserting into the ischial tuberosity. Notice here that the obturator foramen is mostly filled in with this membrane called the obturator membrane, leaving just a narrow canal called the obturator canal. We'll see that there are veins and nerves that pass through these canals called obturator. Again, notice the location of the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. We'll see a number of structures that leave the pelvis by traveling through the greater sciatic foramen. This is a, another view of the pelvis, kind of looking down into the pelvis from above, showing these ligaments again. Here we have a good view of the anterior sacroiliac ligaments sacrospinous ligament from the sacrum to the spine of the ischium, and sacrotuberous from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity. Again, the location of the greater sciatic foramen and lesser sciatic foramen. But first we need to review the bones of the neck. There are seven cervical vertebrae, and they're categorized differently from the other vertebrae is having a few features, two of which um, the bifid spinous process. Some of these cervical vertebrae will have a bifurcated spinous process, but every cervical vertebrae will have a transverse foramen. That transverse foramen is for an artery to deliver blood towards the brain, and that's vertebral artery. It goes through that hole on its way to the brain. The first two cervical vertebrae are special, they're unique. C1 is called the atlas. The atlas is unique because it doesn't have a vertebral body. It is made up of two arches of bone, a posterior arch and an anterior arch. And also the spinous process of the atlas is greatly reduced and which we call a posterior tubercle. The atlas is the first cervical vertebrae. It sits just underneath the occipital bone, so the occipital bone will sit here and allow the occipital bone to rock forward and back, flex and extend, creating a nodding notion, motion. C2 is the axis. The axis is unique in that it has this superiorly oriented process of bone called the dens or odontoid process. This process sticks within the ring of atlas, we'll sit right here, the anterior side of atlas, 
And this will allow the atlas to swivel around the axis, creating a, a shaking of the head motion, like saying no. Okay, the hyoid bone is a very small, delicate, um, arch-shaped bone in the neck. It's not articulated with any other bones. It's held in place by membranes and muscles. You can delicately palpate this bone if you find your chin and go just inferior to your chin, between your chin and your Adam's apple or thyroid cartilage. You should be able to find that hyoid bone. It's made up of a body. The anterior fat part is the body of the hyoid. And then it has two horns. Much of the rest of the hyoid is the greater horn. And then the lesser horn are very small projections that project superiorly. Again, this is held in place by several muscles and membranes. Here is the hyoid resting on top of the rest of the larynx. And we'll get to the larynx when we do the larynx and pharynx dissection and uh, lecture video. Um, but quickly right now, the hyoid is attached to the thyroid cartilage, just inferior to it by the thyrohyoid membrane. The thyroid cartilage is essentially two plates of bone, right? If we look from the superior view, we have the thyroid cartilage is literally two plates of bone, open in the back. On each side is an oblique line, right? This is a muscle attachment for some of our strap muscles we'll discuss in a minute, that oblique line. And inferior to the thyroid cartilage is the cricoid cartilage. The cricoid cartilage is a ring-shaped bone. It's also much smaller anteriorly than it is posteriorly. And it's attached to the thyroid cartilage through the cricothyroid membrane. And there's also an attachment site here with the thyroid cartilage. And then just inferior to the cricoid cartilage is the trachea. Today we will be looking at the skull, cranial fossa, and its vasculature. By the end of today, the students will be able to identify the bones of the cranium and describe the fontanels and sutures, discuss the meninges and the location and functions of dural sinuses, and recognize the differences between the anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa. We will then correspond the foramina or grooves from the cranial fossa to uh, the associated nerves and vessels, and describe finally the blood supply to the brain in the circle of Willis. So when we talk about the cranium, we usually divide it into two, the neurocranium and the viscerocranium. The neurocranium uh, will involve the bony case of the brain uh, plus the meninges, and this bony case of the brain includes the calvaria and the basic cranium. So if you draw a line here, that will be the calvaria on the top and the basic cranium on the bottom. So the bones that form the neurocranium would be um, the frontal bone, the parietal bones, which are paired, uh, there's a left and a right, the temporal bones, which are also paired, the occipital bone, which is located posteriorly, the sphenoid bone, which is, um, you can only see a little part of it from this view, but we will take a look at it in detail because it has many components and is a um, complex bone. And if we look at the sagittal view of the skull, we will see another bone, the ethmoid, uh, which we could only see from this view. If we talk about the viscerocranium, we will see uh, the maxilla, which also has a left and right component, the zygomatic bone, which is a relatively small bone. Um, I will show you the demarcation of it right there. Um, but it has uh, involvement with the zygomatic arch. However, other bones also form the zygomatic arch, and we will see that feature in a few slides. We have the mandible and small bones uh, and delicate ones like the nasal bones, which are located on the superior aspect of the nose and the lacrimal bones, which are located in the medial aspect of the organ. 
So let's take a quick look at the sphenoid bone at this point. Uh, the sphenoid bone is here uh, painted green. It is a complex bone, as I said, and it has several parts that we should mention in detail. The main two parts uh, that will for be forming the sphenoid bone are the greater and the lesser wings of the sphenoid. The lesser wings are located more uh, superiorly than the greater wings. And then we have a central area for the location of the um, pituitary gland that will be uh, the hypophyseal fossa. This hypophyseal fossa is um, guarded at either side, front and back, by the tuberculum cella and the dorsum cella. And all these three are the components of what we call the cella turcica or Turkish saddle. Um, now, this Turkish saddle is surrounded by four posts, like the four posts on a bed, and those are going to be the anterior clinoid processes, clinoid refers to posts, and the posterior clinoid processes. If we take a look at this bone from the front, aspect, um, you can tell because these areas are the back of the orbit. Uh, we will see uh, projections going inferiorly, and those are going to be the lateral pterygoid plates and the medial pterygoid plates. Uh, we will see these guys related to um, muscles of mastication eventually when we look at the oral cavity. Now, if we again take a look at this uh, sagittal view of the skull, um, we can see other bones that belong to the viscerocranium. We have the palatine bones that um, contribute to the formation of the hard palate, the very back of the hard palate. Just for reference, here are the teeth. So this is maxilla forming the hard palate, and the palatine bones are right there. You can um, see in yellow is the sphenoid bone that we just talked about with the pterygoid plates coming down. And then um, we have other bones that are also seen uh, from the inside of the skull, and that would be the inferior knee cell concha. That is its own um, isolated bone, um, part of the knee cell cavity. We have the vomer as well, which is forms part of the division of the nasal cavity. And um, we talk about the ethmoid having um, been part of both the neurocranium and the viscerocranium, especially uh, with some of the plates that in, are involved in the nasal cavity. So now that we saw the different bones, let's take a look at the different features, external features of the skull. So we have things that um, contribute to um, this uh, cheek area, so the zygomatic area. We have the zygomatic bone as a process going superiorly called the frontal process. And take a, a, a careful look at the nomenclature here is the frontal process of the zygomatic. So this is part of the zygomatic bone that is pointing up to meet with the frontal bone here. So that's why it's called the frontal process of zygomatic. Then we can see um, the following the same, same style of nomenclature, we have the zygomatic process of the maxillary bone. Why? Because this is the maxillary bone here, and it sends a project, a projection there to meet with the zygomatic Bone. So it is the zygomatic process of the maxillary bone. We also have the anterior nasal spine, which is just there at the base of the division between um, the two nasal cavities. And we have a mental protuberance, which is the chin area. If we take a look at the side of the skull, we will see the actual um, zygomatic arch, which has a um, zygomatic process from the temporal bone. Again, remember, this is a projection from the temporal bone, which is this bone here, um, sending a projection to go meet with the zygomatic bone 
then we will see um, an opening here. It's called the external acoustic meters. That's uh, it's covered by the ear. Um, and then um, other projections like this one, the mastoid process. We will see how most of these um, bony projections that you see are involved uh, with muscle attachment. Another one uh, we can observe from this view is the styloid process. It's a pointy and long and thus easily breakable. So when you see your um, dry skull, check for the styloid process. Um, be mindful that it could break if it's still there, but most of them won't have it because it has broken off already. Uh, in this view, from the posterior view of the skull, we can also see the mastoid process, and we can see the external occipital protuberance. Um, above and below that, we will see the superior and inferior nuchal lines, which are for attachment of neck muscles. And when we take a look at the inferior aspect of the skull, we will see um, things like the pterygoid plates, the lateral and medial pterygoid plates that we um, saw from a different view belonging to the sphenoid bone and um, right there anteriorly to the medial pterygoid plates we will see the pterygoid hamulus. Uh, you will learn how these are involved uh, with muscles of the oral cavity and muscles of mastication. And then you can see here clearly the psychomatic arch uh, with all of its components. Again, the styloid process that we saw previously and the mastoid process for reference. And also the three things that we just saw in the previous slide, inferior, superior nuchal lines, and the external occipital protuberance. Another one would be the pharyngeal tubercle, which is a point of attachment for the pharyngeal muscles. And also of importance, the mandibular fossa, which is the area where the mandibular condyle will articulate. Now we can take a look at that mandible and we see here is that mandibular condyle that will articulate there on the mandibular fossa that we just saw. Then we have uh, the body of the mandible and the ramus. And then between those two, there's the angle of the mandible. The, um, mandibular condyle uh, is also called the head and anterior to that is the coronoid process also a place for muscle attachments now um, when the um, embryo and the fetus are developing the head needs some sort of flexibility for several reasons um, naturally it needs to be able to be reshaped as um, the baby goes through the vaginal canal during delivery, but it also needs to give room for growth of the brain. So the bones of the skull are not completely ossified and they are definitely not attached to each other at this point. Um, so the areas between these different bones are covered by um, membrane and um, we have sutures that have not yet formed between the bones, and then we also have little windows of space um, that is covered by membrane that allow for this growth. And those windows are called fontanelles. So we have an anterior, a posterior, a sphenoidal, and a mastoid fontanelle. So when these bones grow and um, meet each other, then sutures form, and you can appreciate these um, in an adult skull. So we have different types of sutures, the coronal suture, which happens between the frontal and the parietal bones. And um, this, you should, uh, an easy way to remember this is that uh, when we talk about different uh, views of imaging, uh, we can talk about a coronal view, which means it goes down the body through the coronal suture. And we have a sagittal suture between the two parietals. And again, this one is applied to the um, concept of sagittal view uh, of the body. It's a 
mid sagittal will be down the midline um, following the sagittal suture and then you could that same view could be um, sagittal but not mid sagittal so it could be at either side of the body and then if we take a look from behind we would see the lambdoid suture which is between the occipital and the two parietals this looks like so if we take so if we remove the calvaria like the picture shows you up here and we take a superior uh, view of the inside of the cranium this is what we see we see three cranial fossa this picture is maybe not very clear but the anterior cranial fossa is located a little higher than the middle cranial fossa and the middle is located a little higher than the posterior cranial fossa this is to accommodate this sh particular shape of the brain where you can see that the frontal lobe is sitting higher than the temporal lobes and those sit higher than the brain stem so that sort of um, ladder or st step ladder um, arrangement corresponds to the cranial fossa. Now we will, what we will do is uh, we will take a look at each of the cranial fossa and we'll try to identify all of the foramina and grooves that we see and we'll talk about the associated nerves and vessels. So what I did here is I have this picture that Dr. Winehouse created. Um, in, on one side, on the left side, it has just the cranial fossa. And then on the right side has the soft tissue uh, the, in the nerve, including the nerves and vessels that you will see um, on the cranial fossa uh, after the removal of the brain. So on the left side, I'm going to show you what the names of the openings are. On the right side, I'm going to show you what structures go through. You will have a lecture on cranial nerves, and so I'm not going to spend time naming all these nerves because you will see them coming up next on the next lecture. Um, but rather use these as this these slides as a reference to see uh, what goes through each foramina. Also, this is not an all-inclusive list. There will be other structures that we will be talking about throughout the part of head and neck of the course, but I will not show all of them here because we will see them in detail when we say talk about the orbit or the oral cavity or the nasal cavity. So on the anterior cranial fossa, um, remember is defined at this spot. Um, it has uh, the anterior quinoid processes here as part of it. And these curvatures here are the lesser wings of the sphenoid. So the very front of the anterior cranial fossa, right in the midline, there's going to be a plate called the cribriform plate, uh, part of the ethmoidal bone, and a projection um, that points superiorly called uh, the crista galli. It's not being seen here very well. But um, the crista galli would be the attachment, the anterior attachment of the superior sagittal sinus right there. The cruciform plate will be for cranial nerve one to go through, and the on the very back of the anterior cranial fossa, you will see an opening called the optic canal for cranial nerve two, the optic canal. So the middle cranial fossa is the one that has the most openings and is the most compl complex of all three. And um, this view is hard to see. We will uh, see it in the next slide a little better. But the very first opening is the superior orbital fissure. Right well, behind that, we will have the foramen rotundum. It's a very round foramen. That's where the name comes from. And Posterior to that, 
is the foramen ovale, again, an oval opening on the middle cranial fossa. To the side is the foramen spinosum, named because um, if you take a look at the underneath, underneath this foramen, there's going to be a little bit of a spine of bone, and that is the opening for the middle meningeal artery. You will also likely see the trajectory of the middle meningeal artery. There's a groove that you will find on that side uh, of the skull. And this is, of course, the location of the terion um, where a fracture could occur. At either side of the cella turcica on the bottom, you will see the foramen lacerum. This one, um, notice how it has no correspondence on the right side of the picture. And it is because in life is filled with cartilage. So nothing really goes through, does, nothing exits the, the skull through foramen. Lasser. Behind all of these uh, openings, you will see a uh, hiatus and groove for the greater petrosal nerve. And if we take a look at the sphenoid bone, again, um, we will see in better detail the superior orbital fissure, which is what a lot of the nerves going to the orbit will use to get there. Here, uh, for reference, you can see the foramen rotundum as well. And if we take a look, a detailed look at the orbit, just for orientation, this is the nose here, and this is the um, zygomatic bone right there. So here is the orbit. So we would have the superior orbital fissure there, the optic canal, and what we call the inferior orbital fissure. This is the only way to show the inferior orbital fissure because it really is located between the maxillary, the maxillary bone and the sphenoid bone. If we take a look at the orbit from um, the external view, you would see an opening below the orbit called the infraorbital foramen and one above the orbit which is called the supraorbital foramen, or uh, sometimes it's not com completely closed off, uh, so we would call it the supraorbital notch. Now, if we move on to the posterior cranial fossa, we will be talking about the internal acoustic meatus, the jugular foramen, the hypoglossal canal, and the foramen magnum, obviously, where the spinal cord exits the bony case of the brain and where vertebral arteries go in. In this view, what we will do is look at openings on the undersurface of the skull. One thing that I want you to remember or to take from this is that we will be able to correspond some of these openings with openings that we saw on the interior aspect of the brain, but notice how they will look different from the different views. So here we will see the incisive foramen, the greater and lesser palatine foramen located on the back of the heart palate. We see the foramen ovale, it looks a little different here, the foramen lacerum, the foramen spinosum from this view, and something that we didn't see on the other side, the carotid canal. This is where the internal carotid artery will enter the skull and travel forward before going into to supply the brain. Here, um, it's an opening located between features that we saw earlier, the mastoid process and the styloid process. So naturally, that opening is called the stylomastoid foramen. And then for reference, the foramen magnum as well. Now don't forget the mandible. The mandible has other features like, for example, the mental foramen for the mental nerve, but also the mandibular foramen for the nerves that will go in and travel inside the bone of the mandible to innervate 
the lower teeth. In this session, we're going to look at the infratemporal fossa. Um, first, we're going to start with the bony landmarks that create the infratemporal fossa. Look at the muscles of mastication and their innervation. Describe briefly the TMJ joint, the temporal mandibular joint. Just really briefly describe what the actions of that joint are and what is that joint made up of. And we will go through the branches of the maxillary artery. This is the main artery running through our infratemporal fossa. And then we're going to end with looking at the main nerve through the infratemporal fossa, that being V3 or the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve. So first the bones. We should first start with the temporal fossa. So the temporal fossa is bounded by the temporal lines of the frontal and parietal bones. The frontal and zygomatic bone here anteriorly. The zygomatic arch, which on this other view, right, we can see that's our lateral extent, the zygomatic arch, and then the infratemporal crest, which is um, this right here. I'll outline it, this infratemporal crest right there. That's where the temporal bone goes from sort of the side of the head to the base of the cranium. So that crest right there as the base of the cranium becomes the lateral aspect of the cranium. In this space is really just one thing. It's the temporalis muscle. Temporalis muscle and its attachments sort of sit all in this space. It'll go through this area right here and then down into the infratemporal fossa. The infratemporal fossa is inferior to the temporal fossa, right? So those temporal lines are sitting right there. Um, that's the temporal fossa. Infratemporal, we're going to be inferior to that infratemporal crest. Again, that's going to be right here. Posterior extent is going to be that styloid process. Anteriorly is going to be the zygomatic and maxillary bone. The deep aspect of the infratemporal fossa, sort of where it stops in the... Um, medial side is going to be the lateral plate of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. Also a bit of that maxilla. And then there's, there's a hole, there's a space deep in here that we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. That space right here, that pterygopalatine fossa. And then of course the lateral aspect of the infratemporal fossa, which we can't see here, is the mandible. And so the ramus of the mandible all right, that'll sit right here, the condyle, the condylar neck, and the mandible sort of does something like that. All right, so that's our lateral aspect. Now, um, this structure here, our pterygopalatine fossa, is a complicated structure. A lot of people have difficulty learning this, this, this space, this area, and I think that's because it's a small area, it's difficult to see in our skulls, and the names that make up a variety of the features within this space are all sort of similarly sounding. The pterygopalatine fossa is going to be the space deep to the infratemporal fossa. And to sort of better visualize this space, this is the same netter plate as the last image. Um, but what I'm going to do is, if you will, in your mind, turn this skull to where it's facing us. Right, and so then the... Um, on the screen, this would be lateral. The other side would be medial. Right in the top and the bottom of the screen will be superior and inferior, respectively. This space, from the lateral aspect, we have to go through a fissure. So when if, our, if we're in the infratemporal fossa, to get into this space, the pterygopalatine fossa, we have to enter a fissure, and it's an upside-down teardrop-shaped fissure. That fissure is called the pterygomaxillary fissure. Once we enter into this fissure, we will encounter the pterygopalatine fossa itself. It is a very small space, and in that, there's going to be several things. There's going to be nervous ganglion, there's going to be arteries, veins running through this space, which we will get to in a minute. If you go back, to this photo or this this plate, we can see another structure within the pterygopalatine fossa. We see a little hole. 
that hole right there is opposite the fossa from the fissure. So that would be right here. And so we've got the pterygomaxillary fissure, the pterygopalatine fossa is this area here, and then this foramen, this hole, is going to be the sphenopalatine foramen. So there are going to be many structures in the infratemporal fossa that are going to dive into the pterygomaxillary fissure, course through the pterygopalatine fossa, and exit the sphenopalatine foramen. I'd like to put this pterygopalatine fossa in relation to other cavities that we will be discussing in anatomy. This space is sort of in the middle of multiple major cavities, which we'll discuss throughout this course and things that we've already discussed. So again, we're going to take this plate, we're going to turn it so it faces us. So this side of the screen is lateral. This side of the screen is going to be medial. And we're going to think about the pterygopalatine fossa like a room. It'll be like a box. This box will be the pterygopalatine fossa. Now we already know that we have the pterygomaxillary fissure on one side of this box. This is going to be right here, an upside down teardrop shape. And that pterygomaxillary fissure will take us into the infratemporal fossa. And we know that we have a foramen on the opposite side of this box. That foramen is the sphenopalatine foramen. That foramen will take us into the nasal cavity. So structures that I just mentioned, traveling through the pterygomaxillary fissure, coursing through the fossa, and exiting the sphenopalatine foramen are going towards the nasal cavity. So the next door neighbor of this pterygopalatine fossa is the nasal cavity. The downstairs neighbor is going to be the oral cavity. Upstairs neighbor is going to be the orbit. The pterygopalatine fossa sits inferior to the orbit, lateral to the nasal cavity, superior to the oral cavity. And one more space is the posterior side of the pterygopalatine fossa will be the cranial cavity. So I'm going to draw that out here. Specifically, that'll be the middle cranial fossa. Right, so that sort of comes out this way. We go posteriorly. Now there are other openings to the pterygopalatine fossa that we'll see. We'll see an opening to the cranial cavity. We'll see openings to the orbit. We can get into the oral cavity as well. There are many openings that we will encounter or that we have already encountered, um, but we're not going to discuss those openings right here. What I want to discuss here is the pterygopalatine fossa, its relation to these other cavities, medial to the infratemporal fossa, lateral to the nasal cavity, superior to the oral cavity, inferior to the orbit, anterior to the cranial cavity. Right, It's right in the middle of all of these different cavities. And in this space, in the pterygopalatine fossa, will be many structures on their way to these different cavities. The TMJ is an interesting joint. It's a little complicated. It's between the mandibular fossa or the glenoid fossa of the temporal bone and the condyle of the mandible. The joint space is separated by a disc or a pad of fibrous tissue called the articular disc. So it separates the joint cavity into two different joint cavities. To open your mandible requires both of these joint cavities to work. Initial opening is predominantly a hinge action in the inferior compartment of the TMJ. Right, so that's going to be hinge motion spinning around from the temporal bone and the condyle of the mandible. To fully open your mouth, you not only utilize the hinge joint of the inferior compartment, but you also slide your mandible anteriorly. You, there's a gliding action. Slide the mandible anteriorly to fully open your mouth. Now, as you can imagine, as you can probably see where we're going, if you slide the mandible too far, 
you can dislocate your TMJ or subluxate your TMJ. So this is a closed position. Opening of the mandible requires this hinge motion as well as an anterior gliding motion. But if you go too far, you glide too far, you go in front of the joint extreme here, you can pop out of that joint and then be anterior di anteriorly dislocated. This will lock your mandible open. This will lock your mouth open. You won't be able to close it. You have to manually push the condyle back into its joint cavity in order to close your mouth. The nasal cavity is this area bounded by the cribriform plate, the hard palate. Anteriorly, we have the external nares or your nostrils. We call them external nares. And then your internal nares or coanae posteriorly. This will take us from the nose down into our pharynx, um, essentially the, the superior opening to our gut tube. The nasal cavity is divided into a right and a left half. Right, This is the nasal septum. The septum is made up of a few different structures. There's hyaline cartilage making up much of the septum. That's called septal cartilage. This hyaline cartilage extends all the way out to your external nose. We have the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the vomer making up this nasal septum. If I remove the nasal septum, we can look at the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And we can see three large structures attached to the lateral wall. These three large structures are called conchae. We can also call them turbinates. Right? The job of these conchae are essentially to disturb, to turbinate the air as it enters the nose and goes down into the pharynx. So conchae or turbinate, either one would be fine. There are three conchae. We have a superior concha, which is the smallest one, a middle nasal concha, and the inferior nasal concha. If you notice the coloration of these things, um, the superior and middle nasal concha both come from the ethmoid, while the inferior nasal concha, the largest of the concha, is its own separate bone. The nasal cavity is lined with mucus or mucus membrane. It's lined with mucosa. This essentially secretes mucus, which helps moisten and warm the air entering uh, your lungs. Uh, mucus is also sticky, so it also traps particles or particulates as you breathe in. Um, pretty much everything to protect your lungs from getting really cold air or from too many particulates. If we look at this lateral nasal cavity, this lateral wall of the nasal cavity with our mucosa attached to the bones, we can still see these conchae. Superior, middle, and inferior conchae are still visible. But these conchae, again, are to disturb the air. It's increased surface area of the mucus or of the mucosa so that most of the air can be warmed, moistened, and any particulates can be filtered out before you enter the pharynx and the lungs. Inferior to the nasal conchae is a meatus. Meatus is just a tunnel or, or a groove. And the meatuses are named for the concha that they are inferior to. So the superior nasal concha, just inferior to that, will be the superior meatus. Inferior to the middle nasal concha will be the middle meatus. Inferior to the inferior nasal concha will be the inferior meatus. And there are structures within these meatuses. And so in this next image, what I'm going to do, we will remove the conchae. We'll break them off so we can see deep to them. Here are the cut edges of the conchae, superior, middle, and inferior, the cut edges. So we can see down to the wall of the nasal cavity. Superior to the superior nasal concha, right? Here's the concha and its meatus. Superior to this, 
is a space, the very roof of the nasal cavity, and this is called the sphenoethmoidal recess. This recess right here with this opening. In the middle meatus, we have two structures. We have a bulge of mucosa called the ethmoid bulla. The bulge of mucosa in the middle meatus. And then anterior to this bulge will be a crescent moon shaped structure, sort of divot with a few holes in it. And that's called the semilunar hiatus. And in the inferior meatus, we have another opening, and this opening is called the nasolacrimal duct. Nasolacrimal duct will take us to the lacrimal bone, um, and that'll take us into the orbit. So this is direct communication with the orbit. The paranasal sinuses are spaces in bone, but they're discussed here because they're functionally related to the nasal cavity. They're also lined with mucosa. They secrete mucus to moisten and warm the air, trapped particulates, etc. Um, and they're in direct communication with the nasal cavity. The sinuses are named for the bone in which they lie, and they're all bilateral. So we have the frontal sinuses, maxillary sinuses in the maxillary bone. We have ethmoid air cells. We can call them ethmoid sinuses, but it's um, a little more complicated. There are a bunch of tiny sinuses, so we call them ethmoid air cells. Ethmoid air cells are going to be between the orbits. And then just posterior um, to the ethmoid air cells is the sphenoid sinus. This is going to be in the body of the sphenoid. Like I said, these sinuses are in direct communication with the nasal cavity. They open up into the nasal cavity, into particular and predictable areas. Because they secrete mucus, that mucus needs to be drained, and it's drained with all the rest of the mucus in the nasal cavity in the same way. And so they'll drain out into the nasal cavity so that mucus can then be drained into the pharynx. Also remember here, the nasal lacrimal duct in that inferior meatus is in communication with the orbit. This is for the drain, or this is to drain tears. So as tears, as lacrimal secretions wash over your eyes, they will head towards the lacrimal bone, which they will then be drained into the nasal cavity through the nasolacrimal duct. This is why when you cry, you become all snotty, um, because these tears are flooding your nasal cavity. The paranasal sinuses, we can see are drained in that same plate where we've removed the conche. We can see the structures in the meatuses. The sphenoid sinus will drain into the sphenoethmoidal recess, the very roof of the nasal cavity. The frontal sinus and the maxillary sinus both drain into the semilunar hiatus. Right, that, that area just in front of the bulge of tissue, the ethmoid bulla. The semilunar hiatus has openings for the maxillary and frontal sinus. And the ethmoid air cells, because there are many of them and they are small, they drain into a variety of places. Part of them will drain into the sphenoid or into the semilunar hiatus. Right, we can see in this plate a little hole there. Part of them will drain into the surface of the ethmoid bulla, and then part of them will drain into the superior meatus. The palate is made up of two bones. We have the palatine process of the maxillary bone, and we have the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. And on the palate, there are a couple structures we want to look at. The incisive canal is a unilateral opening just behind your two front teeth. And then on the lateral sides of the palatine bone, we have two holes, the greater and lesser palatine foramina. Now the oral cavity is technically within the bounds of the dental arcades. So all of this space is technically the oral cavity. Your teeth, it's nice to know that you have them and what they are, we have incisors, Canines, premolars, and molars. You have 
um, eight incisors, right? Two on the right, two on the left, in on the uppers and the lowers. So eight incisors will have four canines, eight premolars, and we will have 12 molars. Even though as humans, most of us get rid of these last ones. 